then how do you understand the different schools and how do you find a fit and then how do you communicate your own story. So these are kind of the broad topics we're going to get, go through and the reason that we sort of feel that this is the best way to approach the conversation is because I think a lot of people who are familiar with um, MBA application processes say in India there's a lot of test-based admissions that goes on. So your cat and um, and then maybe maybe um, a uh, interview, a group interview, or something like that. Those are, and, and then also that people tend to not necessarily take the um, two, three to four years of work experience between an undergraduate degree and an MBA. So the global admissions process is very different, and that's um, that's one of the thing, that's one of the reasons why we structured the conversation this way because there's a lot of planning, self self awareness, and then understanding the differences between the schools. Things like um, the components is what most people think of, which is your GMAT, writing your essays, um, doing your interview, maybe getting that work experience. But I think what we really have to make you understand today is there's a lot more to it than that. So let me go get into that. Um, okay. When you think about the MBA application, there's this pyramid, and, and we've, we've, um, we've built this as a pyramid because there isn't a lot of overlap between these components. Okay, so the, the way that your data, that is your GMAT and your GRE score and your undergraduate GPA are, um, what they are at the time of application is, is a very important sort of foundation. And based on that, you can sort of think about how to plan ahead. You can't sort of, with weak data, you can't aim for the top of college um, business programs. With strong data, you have a lot more options open. So then from among those options, how do you decide? Um, the next sort of foundation that, that exists that, that you have control over is your work experience. So a minimum of three years, and then depending on what the, what the brands are in your work experience, the industry you've been in, and the function that you've been in, then you have different kinds of options for, for business school. So those are the two sort of foundational pieces that you, can, that you can control at an earlier stage in the process. Now when it comes to all the next, the next four layers of the application pyramid, your goals, the demonstrated leadership, the extracurricular activities, and then your fit, that's where we sort of come in and help you um, help shape those, those, um, those aspects of your application so that you can be successful in the, in the admissions process. Um, and all of these sort of um, these components on the side, the essays, recommendations, resume form, and interview, those are all there as well alongside. That's something that you know you have to you have to execute on. So those, as well as the two foundational pieces, those are sort of the given things. The other four things, the other four um, rectangles of this pyramid, are the ones that you know we we will we we want to help you understand better today. Okay, so now when you look at the business schools, now these are the top. These are what we call the M7. These are the top top seven business. Schools. Um, across the world, and these, um, if you look at them in many ways, you can see they're very similar, right? So what are some um, aspects that are similar? Things like average age, pretty similar, ranges about 26 to 28. Um, average years of work experience is pretty similar, but there are many aspects in it, of, it, of these, um, this, this data that is different, right? So the so class size is very different. So depending on um, the class size, you might, you might be thinking, um, you know, I need to target or narrow my my focus quite quite a bit because the class is very small and they're looking for a very specific kind of applicant. So the, all of these, this different data is there, and it, it is um, it's there. It's something we can work with, but it isn't necessarily the thing that should drive your choice of, of, of university. So. Um, what the, what the business schools are really looking for, like I said, with these small classes, like if you saw on that slide, the largest one is Harvard, which is 930 students, I think. And um, even, even that is, is pretty small, it's not that big. Um, but when, when you're thinking about these class sizes, what the universities are trying to do is, is curate a class, right? They're trying to build a puzzle. Like they, there is a puzzle and they're trying to find the pieces of it, right? So they're not gonna just take everyone with the highest GMAT score, the highest GPA, and who all worked at McKinsey, right? That would not be a very interesting puzzle. It would be like a stack of pieces that are just on top of each other, right? There's no kind of um, mosaic there. So they're looking for diversity in all of these areas of, such as geography. Do, you know, do we have, do, is our, inter, our international students represented from across the world, the motivation of different students. You know, we have 10 students who want to be investment bankers. We want another five who want to be, you know, arts management um, uh, experts or leaders. 
So, you know, there's a lot of different things that, that each, um, each program is looking for, and the way they put that class together has a lot to do, it's very dependent on these, these aspects. Um, now, this is important because when you're thinking about applying to a business school, you know, you may think, I want to apply to the best ones. Well, the best ones are not the same, right? They're different. So which is the one that you should that fits you the best, and how should you sort of tailor your application to um, to match with their ethos as as uh, in the, in a way that makes them say, you know, this is exactly the right student for us. This is the kind of student we're looking for. So it's all doing the research on the business school ethos and the kinds of students they're looking for can really help you succeed in the process. So these are some word clouds we've put together, and these will keep popping up through the presentation. But for example, the Stanford um, Business School. These are the kinds of words and the kinds of um, topics that come up again and again in the essays that are successful, as well as in the um, in the you know in the program materials themselves. So when you look at something like this, it's very different from this. Can you see that? It's not that one is better or worse, it's just that what they emphasize and, and the kinds of, for lack of a better word, the kinds of buzzwords that, are, that, that make students successful in these two different programs are very different. So understanding this and tailoring your application to it is a big part of what makes students successful, and we've seen that again and again. Um, and then when it comes to, um, you know, how do you, how do you kind of present that, right, to, to a business school and through an application process? There's, there's a story you have to build, right? If you just say, I, I have the highest GMAT score and I have the highest GPA and I have worked in the two best firms and, you know, and therefore I want to go to Harvard, it's not really a story. It's just a sort of set of data pieces. It doesn't tell me what, what, are, what do you think you're going to do? What do you think Harvard's going to do for you? What are you going to be able to contribute to Harvard's class? What's your future goal and how do you see... Um, how have the experiences you've had till now shaped that goal and helped you, you know, sort of help me understand as an admissions officer how you're going to be successful to achieve the goals that you have set for yourself. So there's a lot of different pieces of this story that have to come together. And, um, and the last two are also very important. So, you know, why you? Why, why not the next person, right? You need to really give a compelling, create a compelling narrative around that. And a lot of what that compelling narrative is made up of is, I'm just going to go back to this for a second, are, um, you know, these two things, these things, your, your profes professions, your passions, the things that, um, you know, the things that, uh, th that help build your story have to do with, you know, the choices that you've made. And so sort of articulating those choices and how, um, and how you made them helps, it helps an admissions officer understand how you'll fit into their MBA class. And then the last thing is, why do you need an MBA now? So this is one of the things, I think Cindy can talk more about this, but one of the things when we have, um, you know, when we have people call us, they all say, I want to do MBA. And then the first question we ask is, why do you want to do an MBA now? And that's a very, oftentimes there's, there's a blank sort of, the, the, the other end of the phone is there's, there's no one there. Because <laughs> it's just like, because that's just what I have to do, right? There's, there's this natural progression, and now it's time for an MBA. Well, not necessarily, right? That's, that's, um, that's something you have to make a case for. Career goals, very important. Personal choices. Now, what do we usually mean by personal choices? It's about, say you know your goals right now, you know what you want to do, but what have you done to achieve those goals, right? Uh, you, might, you might be, let me, let me pick a random company, let me pick Deloitte, because we get a lot of Deloitte applications, but let's say you're from Deloitte, and, and you're doing a great job, you're having a great, uh, in terms of career graph, in terms of promotions, everything is going great, but actually based on self-reflection, you decided that, hey, I want to help the farming industry. Right? Maybe on self-reflection you thought I want to ha help the farming industry and maybe, I don't know, you're, somebody in your family was a farmer and you saw how technology can really impact and help people in terms of the farming industry. But that's great. Now you go to business school and say, hey, I've been in Deloitte and I've done ABC things in Deloitte, which is great, which is good because Deloitte gives you a lot of life skills. But you say, post the MBA, I want to come and I want to get into the farming industry. Now when you look at a business school from their perspective, the story does not hold as much water as saying, hey, what have you done before? Have you, for example, decided that in, within Deloitte you wanted to, you asked for projects where you were involved in the farming community? Because Deloitte, I'm sure, any company, any consulting company, I'm sure, will have projects in the farming community. Or you went for the public practice of the consulting company. Or, even better, you quit, you quit the job, you said, I'm too comfortable here, I want to do something about it. So I went and I did my own startup in the technology space. Or you work with a company in the farming space, for example. 
those are your personal choices and because i say you don't do things that you're asked to do but you're actually doing things that you want to do and there is coherence in your entire story and that's what we're looking to see and of course everything achievement achievement is basically track record right so it's all track record so you're saying i i know what i want i've done stuff because i want to do what i want but here hey look at this because i have achievement i have wherever whatever i've done i have been achieving in all these things and that's something business schools are very very keen to see uh and i keep touched upon this uh, but the point of this is that guys mba is not mba is a professional degree right it's not like an undergraduate degree where you have to do it uh, it's more of a question of what do you want to do where do you want to do it but an mba it's a decision you're personally making should i go for it should i not go for it so it's a very personal decision and you have to say mba this year makes perfect sense for me and that's the reason why we added this point where we said rational for why you need an mba now and that's what business school thinks so we get a lot of people a lot of engineers who apply with us and the point of this is not saying that like an engineering degree is uh, is obviously like a like I'm an engineer myself right so i i shouldn't be talking much about the engineering degree but so i understand the value of the degree uh we learn a lot in the engineering degree but the point i'm trying to make is that there are and because it's india and its population so we have so many people applying uh from the engineering background so you really have to understand uh, apart from what i have in terms of engineering degree what else do i have in terms of how to uh, differentiate my profile and that's the point of reflecting on your points of difference do you have something in extracurriculars do you have something in terms of social impact do you have something in terms of sports that you did do you have something in terms of your goals in terms of So that's the point that we want to see, and that's why and self awareness again comes back here, and that's why reflecting on your points of difference is very important. Identifying gaps in your profile, and then clarifying your career goals. Now, coming up with career goals is great, but it's always good to have multiple points of view. If you have an advisor, if you have somebody you look up to, if you want to go to a professional, any case, but you also have to have that clarity in terms of what your career goals are, and do they make sense? And a great way, obviously, is to use the information available to all of us, which is. social media which is the internet which is to find out that okay this is what i want to do how many people in my domain or in my sector what have they achieved or gone on to achieve post the mba does that make sense does mine make sense and we have one against each other to get some clarity on your career goals okay so all of this in terms of what your goals are what you want to do all of this comes together in terms of finding your school and your program so finding a fit is essential when you look at choosing your school and your program know your business schools now business schools know that you know you're not going to apply to one business school right at the end of the day it's just stupid if you want to say that i'm going to apply to one school and look at harvard and if i don't get to harvard that's it that's not a great strategy so you ideally want to have at least like say five to 10 schools at least 10 schools that you say okay these are schools that kind of make sense for me and the way you can get that is by research lots and lots of research this is the back breaking part of it you really have to know how you connect with that school and business schools know this as well they know you're not applying to only one school but they want to know that if i am on that list of 10 schools why have i made it into that list right as a business school i want to understand what is it that the person liked about my school that he or she said i want to apply to your business school it could be a specific professor it could be a great class or it could be some like a like great internship opportunity that the company provides sorry the school provides or they have great relationship with a lot of industries so whatever it may be or you have great alum who talk, told you about the culture and about how good the alumni network is whatever be the reason you have to understand and tell us why sort of sort of we sort of called it love thy school but the point is you understand your business school and that will come out in your writing application that's the point of this positioning yourself we talked about at length here so when you position yourself and you know the school that you want to do you can sort of start making that fit and say hey i want to get into finance i want to be in new york this uh, i know that nyu has a great tie up with company a or company b uh, this is a kind of a dream role for me because of what i've done before in my life everything comes together so i think in my unique perfect sense for me that's the kind of story you want to present and all of that your one chance to do all of this is at the interview right when the interview whether it's an ad com interview whether it is an alum interview what they are looking to see is is there a fit do i want to look at this person and say hey i want to be associated with him for the rest of my life because if i say come on board it's basically saying that me and you are from the same school for right it's me saying if there's a fit between me and you and in terms of what your stories are saying are you a genuine person in terms of what you're saying so we have we have all our uh, successful applicants right here so they will be in the panel soon but i guess i uh, hope a lot of them concur with what i'm saying right so you'll have a chance to mingle with okay so this is a very representational slide i am not endorsing or talking anything
talking about specifically about these programs. But the point of this slide is basically for me to tell you that there are multiple ways of achieving the same thing, right? So you don't have to say, okay, I only want to look at the top schools, I only want to look at HPS, I want to try how a Stanford works, and if I can get in, then basically I'm not going or I can't achieve my dreams. There are lots of other ways for you to also achieve what you want to achieve. And the point of this slide is to, again is that it just goes back to the knowing your business too. Maybe you want, maybe you're in a family business, right, uh, where you're sort of sure that uh, I'm coming back to my family business or I'm come, or you have, you have a job post MBA and you say, no, I just want to know about, want to go to grade school and get that great MBA. Then maybe the J-term in Colombia makes sense because it might not give you opportunities to inter for internship, but you'll get the same cohort, you'll get the same network, you'll get the same classes, but you can still do your MBA and then come back and then go back to your family business, but you have that MBA from Colombia, right? Kellogg has a one-year program where you feel, I don't want to spend two years of my life doing an MBA, I have to think that I have the financial constraints or I have my whole, my thought process is a little different where I want to spend only one year out of work, then maybe the Kellogg one-year MBA makes sense. So maybe you're a very tech-focused guy and you want to get into FinTech, the NYU Stern has a tech MBA that you can focus on and you're from tech, for example. So the point of this, yeah, exactly, it's very representational, but the point is understand and know that there are multiple ways of reaching the goal that you want. So the goal, I repeat, is very important in terms of what you want to do. Okay, um, so the, uh, I don't know if you guys can read it, so I'll probably read it out. So uh, basically, this slide is most, mostly about how to buy shortlist schools, and we're giving you more parameters where you can start thinking in terms of how can I start making that shortlist. Because if you want to come up with a list of 10 to 15 schools, apart from all the things that we discussed before, it would be about learning style. Right? Some schools have case-based methods, some schools are very small in terms of um, how the class sizes are and you feel I'm, I thrive in an environment where I have only few people in my class, I want to know everybody in my cohort. Like I did my MBA from HEC Paris and then we had 120 people in the class and to this day I know everybody by name and we're always connected either on online or through WhatsApp or however we want to. And the point of that for me was great and that's something I wanted from my MBA was that I would get that kind of network where I'm not only like friends but also build my network through my career. And so it was very, it was a good fit for me. But if you feel you want to be in a bigger class, basically that has a lot of case-based method where I want to learn everything by doing instead of sitting in a theater-based classroom, then maybe you can look at a Virginia Darwin and say because they do a lot of case-based uh, teaching. Obviously everybody knows that Harvard, Harvard is the number one for case-based method, but I also want to emphasize that there are other schools out there like Virginia Darwin as well, which do case-based um, case teaching. Uh, and I want, I want to take access to industry practitioners and recruitment opportunities together because essentially they are saying the same thing. It's again understanding where you want to have a career. Like knowing yourself and saying, okay, for example, I gave that example of finance. A lot of people in finance want to be uh, along the East Coast because New York and, and that part of it is a finance belt, right? So if you want to be in that part of the world, then you say, okay, I want to be in finance. I want to be in that part of the world. So then. The schools that are located there, you talk about Columbia, you talk about NYU Stern, you talk about Cornell, all of these schools might give me that access to make it happen in terms of going out, talking to people, connecting, right? So that's that's what I want to say here, with recruitment as well as access to industry practitioners. Um, some schools also offer interdisciplinary uh, courses, right? Uh, a lot of schools have tires within the university where they say, hey, you can, do the, you can work with us in the business school, but you can also take up electives in other schools within the university. And if there is something there that is interesting to you, right? For example, the Ross School, it has a tie-up uh, with the Earth Research uh, School in, in within Michigan, where you can take some electives if you're interested in the energy space or in the renewable space or in sustainability. So you can take that course, you can get those electives, and then you can do the MBA with Ross, and then you can get these electives done there in terms of credits. So these are the things, again, that you have to do in terms of research. Program location, I don't have, again, we just mentioned about it, but you know, even things like, should I pick the US, should I pick Canada, should all of this will be defined by your goals uh, and wherever you feel the opportunity is there, wherever you have a great network uh, and a lot of other constraints will come together for you to make this And the last thing I just want to spend a minute because I think alumni network guys, again MBA is not a professional degree, or so it's not an academic degree, you're not going there just for the academics uh, because it's a very, very broad and a diverse degree so you get to learn a lot of different things in a short period of time. So the one thing that you really gain from uh, MBA is the alumni network, right? So you really want to understand how big and how good the alum network is. It could be about how extensive it is. It could be about how responsive they are. It could also be about um, how many people in that alum industry, you know, cater to your industry, for example. So a lot of these things can go into deciding what's going uh, and, and a great way to actually gauge that is, you know, 
as even as an applicant, you can probably get onto LinkedIn, for example, and, and say I pick a school, and then you can start reaching out to these people, and you get to see how many people are interested in terms of how they reply to you, how easily they reply to you, and if you do connect with an element, see how passionately he's talking about that school. So that gives you that sort of a feeling about how the engagement is going to be once you do the MBA from that school as well. Okay, so now the now you know what your goals are, you know what uh, location you want to apply, you also know that. Uh, like in terms of how to shortlist a school. So you have your list of 10 schools, right? Now how do I categorize these schools, right? Now these, these are words that you might have seen a lot, which is stream, target, uh, um, and backup. Uh, but the point of this is essentially once you have those 10 schools, to al always categorize them into different uh, buckets. Now what is a dream school? A dream school is not Harvard and Stanford because they're Harvard and Stanford. That's not the point of a dream school. A dream school is a school where all of the things we mentioned before, in terms of where they are, what your goals are, whether, how big the alum network is, all of those things come together, they help you achieve your goals. And because it helps you achieve your goals, I'm sure it helps a lot of people in terms of, a lot of people think in the same way, and that sort of makes them a little more selective. And that's why you're, like, if you remember the data slide uh, from when they presented uh, a while back, so you saw, for example, a Stanford has a acceptance rate of 5%, right? Like, like 400 applicants they take, they get 8,000 applications. So because a lot of people think everything for me makes sense at Stanford and a lot of people are applying at Stanford. So that's how you put into a dream packet. But I also want to emphasize that the dream does not mean only the brand-wise dream, but schools that you think will help you achieve your goals but are more selective. Same for Target, again, everything is the same. They help you achieve your goals, but maybe you're in that bracket where you feel that this is something that is achievable for me. Maybe you're compromising on something in terms of, uh, like a small compromise in terms of the selectivity, in terms of the brand name, in terms of the location. Something interesting. And backup schools. Now, I specifically removed the word safe here and put in the word backup because everybody usually goes for the normal which of safe schools. And when I say safe, because if I say safe schools, everybody starts thinking of schools that they have a 100% chance of getting into. And that's not the point of safe schools. Safe schools are also schools where you still have to think in terms of your goals and still say, does it make sense? Because if you're in finance and you get some school um, in, in, in some other part of the country, maybe it doesn't make sense for you go to that school just because it's easy to get in. So a safe school need not mean a school that you will 100% make it. It's more, that's why we use the word back up here. So I want to just talk about the MBA essays and I think these, you know, these three points, they're reflective, interesting and relevant. Uh, interesting is a bit of a vague word, but what we mean by that is you know, making your story sound, not sound, but finding yourself, the interesting aspects of your story. What is it, if you just tell me that, you know, if, if the question, and again, the app, MBA application essays vary, but from across different um, um, MBA uh, programs. So, for example, um, and I'm just making this up, but for example, say Kellogg might ask you, three questions and one of them has to do, you know, talk about a time you did something beyond your um, job description and made an impact or something like that. Whereas another school like Harvard just says, tell us what else we need to know, right? That's quite open-ended. So they're saying, you know, you've, you've sent us all this information in the application, now we want to know something more about you, for, for, you know, that, we, that you think we should know, what else should we know? So they're very different the way that these are structured. Um, but really what they're looking for is, you know, the way that Harvard puts it actually, it feels a bit vague, but it's exactly what these essays are for, which is we've got all your data. We know all where you've worked. We've understood the projects you've worked on. Everything is there in the application form and the resume and um, even in your recommendations. So we know all of that. But this is your opportunity to tell me who you are as a person. Why have you made those choices, right? Why have you made the? Cho why are you so passionate about the energy sector, right? Um, and again, this is something that this is also your opportunity to connect the dots between all those things, right? So to say that I am um, really interested in energy, and so is the next applicant. But I am interested in it because you know I worked on a project. Um, I've been working on a project actually since maybe say high school and through college. You know, in high school I, I identified this, then I went to college and became an engineer so that I could really work even more um, on a technical level with this problem. And now I've been consulting for a few years, and this has just been my passion for for a really long time. Whereas the next person who's who's interested in the energy sector and and this is their their story is is much more about you know, not having that much experience, but seeing that you know, certain things like maybe say, um, 
uh, farmers and agriculture and water. They've worked on a lot of um, consulting projects that have to do with ag agriculture, and they've realized, you know, the important uh, uh, the, the issue of scarcity of water, and that's driving them to kind of learn more and understand that and develop that goal. So those are two of the same goals, but very, very different stories of how they got there. So the essay is really your opportunity to tell that story, okay? And from that point, from for that perspective, you know, it really needs to be really reflective and show me who you are as a person. Why have you made that choice, right? So just to say I did it and then I won an award and then I did another award and then, um, you know, I felt really proud and then I got another job. I mean, that's just a kind of, again, a list of your achievements and things that are in your resume anyway. So I don't really want to hear that as a... Um, as, a, as an admissions officer, I don't want to just keep reading that story. And again, everyone has it, right? Everyone who's applying to business school has recently finished college, done a job for two to three years, and um, is now applying to business school. So how do you make that something that is, your story should just kind of go a little bit beyond that and, and let me see a little bit more. So take me backstage on your life a little bit. Um, and I think that the last point here is relevant. And as Sandeep said, you know, if you get into talking about how you know, how passionate you are about something um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think of an example of, but anyway, so you're talking about something that's, that you're really passionate about or a way of learning that really works for you, but you find out later that, or, or you never find out because you never do the research, that that university does not actually um, endorse or promote or support that kind of learning, right? They're, they're all about, you know, flipped classrooms or something, and what you really want is one-on-ones with, with faculty. That's a very different... Um, learning style and a different sort of learning structure. So you need to make sure you know the university and that you're talking to them in their language. Otherwise, it just feels like a big disconnect, right? Because the last thing they want to see, if I'm sitting at, you know, Michigan Ross, the last thing I want to see is an essay that looks like it really, you know, suits Harvard. I can tell that you wrote this essay for Harvard, but you're applying to Michigan Ross. Like, I would, I would be able to know that, and I would probably not be very interested in that applicant. So you need to make each and every essay very specific. And like I said, it should not be you know, a laundry list of your achievements that are already there in your essay. It shouldn't be copy-pasted from another, um, another uh, business school's application because like we're trying to um, emphasize here each one is different and what, what um, students need to say is different in every case. Um, and it shouldn't be a job description. So this is my... <laughs> I guess this is what I think the MBA team hears from me a lot. They'll say, can you look at this essay? We're not sure. It's kind of missing something. And so then I'll read it. And, I, and the question is, you know, when have you, when have you made an impact in your career? And I read it, and I'm like, all it sounds like here is that this person did their job. This is their job description, and they did it. So that is not making an impact in your career. That is like a description of, you know, I put, got put on a project, everyone there was 10 years my senior, and as the youngest member of the team, I got buy-in from them, and I convinced them that, you know, this was going to be, um, that they should implement this new program. But that's really what you're supposed to do, right? That's, that's your job as a consultant or as, as a leader of a project or something. So don't just, just repeat that and, and expect that to be like, wow. You need to tell me, you know, what was hard about it? What, where did you feel insecure about it? How did you overcome that? You know, these are the things that, that, that really bring the story to life. Um, okay, so no, when it comes to these essays, I mean, again, I think I, this is a lot of repetition, but because of what I'm saying about how... Um, how, how unique each one has to be, how you cannot copy paste Stanford, Harvard, Wharton, Ross, Fuqua, whatever. You need to start early with the research and you need to understand again, what, the, what is the question asking? Is the question asking you, you know, about impact? Have you told a story about impact or have you just told a gener generic story? Okay, um, and there, there's a lot of research involved, which is part of why we're saying you, you must start early and then be genuine and, um, and then if you, but I, I think this repurpose with a purpose is, I, I am saying don't copy paste, don't use the same essay. But Stanford and Harvard, those essays are quite long, they're quite um, comprehensive, but they need to be different. But that doesn't mean that you have to be a different person or you have to have a different story. I mean, obviously you're the same person, it's just the way you tell the story. So you are going to repurpose, maybe the structure is the same, but maybe the way you emphasize certain points is is different in the two. So make sure you're aware of, you know, how can I use the material I've already written, because it would be foolish not to, but at the same time make sure that it's tailored towards, you know, what, what the sort of ethos and, and what that, you know, that um, business school is looking for. Um, again, understanding the prompt, I just want to say this because now, like I said, Harvard Business School has, 
an essay that's kind of big and open-ended. But um, when, I, when we first started, when the Red Pen first started, the question, there were three, there were, talk about, um, there were three questions. There were six questions. And it was, talk about three achievements and talk about three setbacks. Okay, and that was it. And, and each one was like 200 words. So you had to write six essays that were 200 words each. It's a lot more directive, but I think I can understand why they got, a, got a, moved away from that because probably people just wrote those three achievements. You know, the, the, the admissions committee already knew it because it was already there in, in their resume. So they changed it now. But when we used to work with that essay, the, what often would happen with, with, with the three setbacks, actually they weren't setbacks. So when it says here, understand the prompt, you know, the, you really have to make sure you're answering the question because if you write me, you know, three stories that actually don't sound like setbacks, it's going to be, it's going to just raise a bunch of other flags and questions. So make sure that you are answering the question properly and, and really giving, trying to understand what is it that they want from you and, and give that to them. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. Now, this is one of the ways that we do tell students to, especially uh, applicants, especially to start the process. You don't have to always end with this. And sometimes, you know, this, this kind of a framework can turn out to be really boring in the end. It's like just kind of, you know, um, box standard, straightforward. But it does help you get the story out, right? You know, um, so what we often tell um, students to do in, this, in, the, in the beginning phase of this essay writing is work with the STAR framework. And STAR, I'm sure all of you know, is situation, task, action, result. So making, um, sort of creating a bank of your stories from now, especially if you're a few years away from this, it's a really good idea to make sort of a bank of these stories so that when these essay questions come up, you can say, you know, I have got these experiences and I've written them all down in this format. Now let me see how I can, how I can kind of, um, um, kind of manipulate these essays and these stories in a way that helps me tell the right story for this, this um, university. But the STAR framework is something I think that helps people think, how do I get started, right? I, I don't know what to say, so how do I get started? Do that with many of your different experiences. Mm -hmm.